Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is what I'm going to call classic antecedent-contained deletion, or ACD, as illustrated in one. Mitt will read every newspaper that Sarah will. Um, this is often cited to Boughton, 1970, and it actually is in there in one sentence of this type in a footnote. Most of his paper was concerned about a closely related construction that I've got a lot of stuff on the handout, but I'm not going to say anything about due to lack of time. But he did have one example of this type, which was literally, this is his actual example, Hiram oogled the same girl that Aaron had. And clearly, oogle was a kind of prescient form. Its etymology is it means to oogle someone is to lewdly stare at a picture of them that you found by an internet search engine. <laughs> <laughs> He, he knew this word was coming in 1970. Okay, well, the, the really chapter one and verse that begins the history of discussion about this construction comes from Ivan's thesis. What he said in his thesis has literally become the textbook wisdom on this in some circles. It's in the Hyman Kratzer textbook. I'm going to phrase this in modern terms rather than in exactly the terms that Ivan used, but it's basically the same idea, and this is basically his analysis. Now, there's two key pieces to his analysis, two key assumptions. One, and the ones that are really important, the ones I give in Roman numerals three and four here, so you can skip right to those. One is that um, VP ellipsis in general, including this type, requires an overt linguistic antecedent to supply either a representation or a meaning. You have to have something overtly said to supply or to be identical to uh, the meaning and or representation. And the second crucial assumption was that in order for everything to compose up properly in the ACD case, the, what has to be found is a VP meaning, a meaning of type ET. And so therein lies the antecedent containment paradox. There is no overt VP that can supply the right meaning without or representation without this paradox of an infinite regress. Therefore, Ivan argued, there must be a process that pulls, uh, 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 there must be a logical form where the, in something like Mitt read every newspaper that Sarah will, every newspaper that Sarah will must be pulled out at LF, logical form, giving a representation like read trace or read X, which can be supplied as the missing meaning. So this appeared to give evidence for logical form, uh, as well as the idea that binders are pulled out at LF. So there's two key pieces. I'm going to reject both of his assumptions in this talk. The first one is not that crucial to my main point, but I want to say it very quickly. Uh, the second is more crucial. So the first assumption I'm going to reject is that there needs to be an overt linguistic antecedent. In other words, I'm going completely counter to what Hankamer and Sog 1976 claimed. And I would like to believe that actually all instances of VP ellipses, including this type, are actually deep anaphores, that they simply pick up contextually salient meanings. But for some reason, property type meanings are very fragile, hard to just pull out of the air. And so they like to be made salient by having been named. So what we call the antecedent is really not an antecedent. It's merely the constituent that happens to name the property that gets picked up. And so the illusion of an antecedent is from that. There is no such thing as a real linguistic antecedent. Of course, this begs the question of why is it so difficult? We know in the literature that it's very difficult to pick these things up from context. They really like to be named. And I will punt on that question today. I uh, uh, won't say anything more about that. So some explanation is needed for that. But as long as we know there are some cases where the meaning can be picked up by context, everybody has to ask, why does that only occur in some context cases? So I'm saying it's always picked up by context, but often it's just that there's an, another VP that names the relevant property. Of more direct relevance to what I want to talk about today is the rejection of the idea that you need to pick up a VP meaning. So I have a series of papers on this construction and I've called it transitive verb phrase ellipsis or TVP ellipsis. Basically in this antecedent contained uh, case what's happening is there's just a missing two place relation rather than a missing um, property. And we know from the categorical grammar literature and even the GPSG literature and so forth if you have something like uh, a similar case like Mitt will read every book that Sarah will read. We don't need to say read is read trace. It can just be read, the transitive verb read. And it's been discussed a lot in the categorical grammar literature. There's various techniques to get this to compose up to give a good meaning. One would be to function compose read with will and so forth and it all works out just fine. And I want to say that exactly the same thing is going on in the case where that isn't there. Roughly what you get at the end of the day in the antecedent contained case is what I show in four. 
the actual meaning is a function looking for a two-place relation, R, and it maps that relation into MIT will read every book that Sarah will function compose R. Okay, and then the missing meaning is picked up from having been made salient because it was just named in the main clause, read, and pick it up just like in VP ellipsis. Um, if this is all correct, then um, there's nothing really special about ACD as kind of a misnomer. ACD is just the case where the missing meaning happens to be supplied by a verb which is in the matrix clause. Okay. But you can get this transitive verb phrase ellipsis across clauses. You can get things, Frederick Evans discovered these or talked about these in 1988. Bagels I like, donuts I don't, where what's picked up is just life and it goes across clauses. And if I'm right that you can get these things as deep anaphores, then this type of transitive verb phrase ellipsis ought to be able to also come where it's just you get the missing relation from context. And I've constructed some cases in some of my papers where that's true. Take seven, where dad takes a tray of cookies out of the oven, puts them on a plate. There's an earlier batch here that's cool, and a kid goes to grab the hot batch, and daddy says, uh-uh, uh, those you made, these you can't, at least not until they cool down. I think it's perfect and seamless. So you can get this missing transitive verb uh, phrase type ellipsis as well. This basic idea that all that's going on here is that this is a missing transitive verb type meaning actually goes back to a paper by Annabelle Cormax in 1984, and then I have a series of papers extending it to the other Boughton cases and to a variety of constructions. I should also say something I forgot to say, that one of the centerpieces of Ivan's thesis was a discussion about where you get a certain day, ray, day, dicto, ambiguity goes away under ellipsis, and I just don't have time to talk about that today. I wish I did. I love that fact. I love that fact, but no time for that today. Okay, so if this really is just a matter of picking up a missing, uh, picking up a two-place relation, the interim conclusion is that we don't need QR, we don't need to pull the binder out in order to get a representation like read X or read trace, because we don't need a VP, we just need a transitive verb phrase, and therefore we don't need LF. So the interim conclusion is that there is no LF. Okay, but that's not the end of the story. If it were, um, it would be a nice eight-minute talk. But I have more to say. Um, so the chapter in verse resurfaces recently in a paper by um, Hockel, Martin Hockel, Koster, Hale, and Varvudis, published in Journal of Semantics last year. And they try to sort of say, ah, we actually have some new processing evidence for the Sagian type story. And basically oversimplifying, they're looking at things like 10A and 10B. Mitt read every newspaper that Sarah did versus Mitt read the newspaper that Sarah did. And they find a contrast between these. They find that in the the condition, there is a slowdown in reading times at the ellipsis site. Now, they actually put some additional material after this site, which I don't have here. But um, uh, I'm just kind of oversimplifying their examples to make the point. And they find that in the, the the sentences are less acceptable than the every sentences. And here's how their explanation goes. Their logic is as follows. Assume that there really is QR in the every case. Assume, moreover, that the processor only um, performs QR when forced to. So since the NPs denote individuals, or at least can denote individuals, and they're assuming that read wants an individual type thing in object position, generally you don't need to have QR applying in the the condition. So what happens in the every condition is as soon as the parser hits every, it has to do QR because of this type mismatch. They're rejecting theories that say, no, there's a way to shift read into something that wants a quantificational object or other ways to handle object quantification. They're rejecting that. Um, so as soon as the parser hits every, it uh, has to perform QR. It does so. This gives the antecedent, this gives a representation read trace. It gets to the ellipsis site, it needs to pick up, they're assuming the Sagian story, it needs to pick up a VP meaning, so it picks up read trace and, and oh, I should point out the way they phrase it, you, you know, the processor doesn't know what meaning it's trying to <laughs> compute, so it doesn't know that it wants to, you know, but the point is read T is available to pick and it picks up that meaning. In the the case, it hasn't performed QR, so it gets to the ellipsis site and it can't find an antecedent. Now, of course, it doesn't know what antecedent it's looking for, but I guess what they're assuming is that it's just trying something, and it says, well, maybe if I do QR, I'll get myself an antecedent. So it does QR, and then it gets retrace, and it can supply it. 
And so that would predict that that would be a little more work and there'd be a slowdown because you have to do QR at that point and in the every case you've already done it. So their assumption is therefore that this supports the SOG story. It shows that it's not just a matter of transitive verb phrase ellipsis, but really it is a matter of getting a whole VP, supports the need for LF and for QR. Okay. So the next chapter in all this is a reply, and this is collaborative work with Ted Gibson and Ev Fedorenko and Peter Graff and uh, Steve Piantadosi in preparation, or perhaps beyond preparation, I'm not quite sure, collaborator, <laughs> um, close to in submission. Um, and what we are arguing is that actually this difference between the the and the every condition has absolutely nothing to do with QR. Okay, and it also has nothing to do really with a processing difficulty, but just an acceptability thing. So the first fact, before I give you our hypothesis, the first fact, oh, I should go back one second. I forgot to say one thing. When you look at 10, mid-read every newspaper that Sarah did and mid-read the newspaper that Sarah did, they're careful, HKV, are careful to point out that this isn't a fact about every versus the. Because if you get something like 10C, Mitt read every newspaper that Sarah bought, or read, Mitt read the newspaper that Sarah bought, you get no contrast. But what they didn't do was look at what happens with the same verb. They looked at different verbs. So um, we, I should say, really, my experimental collaborators, ran uh, this on Mechanical Turk, acceptability judgment tasks, with stimuli like 11, uh, th you, these are not exactly the ones we use. This is a sort of pared down version, but again, to make the point in the talk. So Mitt read every newspaper that Sarah read versus Mitt read the newspaper that Sarah read. There's no reason why QR, there's nothing that should force QR in the the case in those. Okay, so that story does not extend to these cases, their story. They actually have a little sentence saying maybe it does, but we argue against that. Basically, nothing would predict that the the case needs to QR. Guess what? We find the same or almost the same acceptability difference between the every case and the the case showing that it has nothing to do with QR. The effect is a little stronger with ellipsis than it is without ellipsis, but our story actually predicts that as well. So the first conclusion you can draw for this is that this contrast between every and the really has nothing to do with QR. Why are the the cases, and I think most people's intuitions are there's something a little weird about the the cases. Well, when you talk to people, everybody sort of wants to change them to the same book, that, the same newspaper, or, that, or the newspaper that Sarah also read. So in the the condition, but not in the every condition, and I'll come back to why that might be so, there's a very strong pressure if the things are the same, and coincidentally the same, to highlight that by either saying the same book or also. And the rest of the uh, experiments that they ran um, sort of showed that that's correct. So first of all, if you change it to the same, every has no advantage. Now that's also consistent with the HKV story because under most accounts the same is also quantificational, would have to undergo QR, but it's also compatible with our hypothesis. If you add also in, there's no advantage of every over the. So if you have mit red, uh, where are these examples? This is 13. Mit read every newspaper that Sarah also did and mit read the newspaper that Sarah also did. Under their story, the advantage should still be there for every over the, because the would have to undergo QR later. But there is no advantage there for every other, uh, over the in these cases. As long as you put in the also, these are fine, or the same, these are fine. So, I'm fine actually. Um, so, our hypo and, and also with context, this disappears. So, our hypothesis is that if there isn't some priorly established connection between these same events, there's a very strong pressure to highlight that they're the same. So, it disappears with context, and I won't go into those examples. Um, what does this, uh, what leads, why is this a greater pressure with the than with every? Well, one hypothesis that we are, we're, we've been exploring is that in the case of the, you, you don't have every same. I mean, you don't have the competition. There's no competing form. And moreover, you can say every also as well as the also, but for reasons we don't entirely understand, it actually degrades. It's worse to have every also than just every. So you don't have that same pressure with every as with the. But I'd like to end by looking ahead to a further speculation hunch that I have that I'm hoping to do more collaborative work to see if this is correct. Uh, and this actually stems from a, 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 
an observation or suggestion that Jeff Pullum made and also comes out of conversations with Laura Kurtz that we all had in the fall at Brown, which is that every kind of pushes towards this almost copycat reading. Mitt read every newspaper that Sarah did, and the doesn't. And again, I don't know why that's true. But my hunch is that if we ran some um, studies, we would find that if you gave the following, what would happen? Let's say um, I gave it, I changed Mitt and Sarah to Sam and Sue. Okay, so take 19. Sam read every book that Sue did. Sue read Crime and Punishment. And if we ask people how true do they think the following sentence is, Sam read Crime and Punishment because Sue read Crime and Punishment. I suspect we'd get a greater yes than if we said, Sam read the book that Sue did. Sue read Crime and Punishment. Did Sam read Crime and Punishment because Sue read Crime and Punishment? This is just a hunch. But my hunch is that the causal relation with every will be there more clearly than the causal relation with the because of this kind of copycat reading. And this is why with every we can establish independently a connection between these two events, which we can't do with the. And if we can't establish this independently, the connection between the two events, there's a really strong pressure. You want to say also or you want to say same to sort of stress, oh yeah, it is kind of a coincidence unless you've got some other reason to stress that these are, to, to know that these events are connected. Once again, one of the key points is that you get exactly the same effect with the full verb, um, even without any actual ellipsis. So in sum, 37 years after SOG 1976, my conclusions about antecedent contained deletion in logical form is that there is no, no deletion and there is no logical form. <laughs> But it's been a lot of fun working on this, and it's been a great problem and inspired a lot of research. So thank you, Ivan, for giving us this wonderful domain. <laughs>